We are delighted that you could join us this afternoon to recognize the extensive support and contributions of Paul and Janice Hessling to the Martha Blake Lee Hodges Special Collections and University Archives, as well as the University Libraries, mm -hmm. by naming the Home Economics Pamphlet Collection in their honor. At this time, I would like to introduce Interim Director of the UNCG University Libraries, Mike Crumpton, who will say a few words. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I've been here uh, 15 years, and it's been my honor to have uh, Paul as a colleague for these 15 years. But a greater honor was bestowed earlier this year when I got to present him with his 35-year uh, anniversary pen. And so 35 years of service is absolutely wonderful achievement uh, for anyone, but especially a great colleague like Paul, and we really appreciate that. And I have a few comments I was going to share regarding uh, Paul's contribution to our organization. And I have to say, uh, uh, when asking colleagues for uh, some suggestions and ideas, they very enthusiastic enthusiastically provided uh, a wide range of things to talk about. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to read uh, through a few things just to share with you some of the, the breadth and depth of, of Paul's involvement in our organization. Uh, Paul Hessling is a special collections and chief monographic cataloger and associate professor for the university libraries. Uh, he's an expert in cataloging manuscripts, rare books, and archival material. Uh, he has deep knowledge of the complex and detailed world of bibliographic materials and, data, and data, metadata. And if you don't know what that means, that's okay. It's what helps library users find and identify the, need, the, the materials they need in our online systems. In addition to his work with metadata for library resources, Paul has helped train and support the work of numerous catalogers here at UNCG, serving as a patient and knowledgeable resource person in the department and approaching this work with humor and insight. And as a faculty member, he has served in numerous times as member of the library's promotion and tenure committee, including being chair, and he's recently served as a UNCG faculty senator representing us. Uh, he guest lectures for courses in our uh, library and information science program in the School of Ed, and he produces posts for the American Trade Bindings and Beyond blog, which includes in-depth essays on publishers, uh, graphic designers, and other aspects of the fascinating world of trade bindings. So as an example of Paul's uh, tenacity and dedication, um, a little story about um, hitting the road uh, hard on, in pursuit of some collection, special collections material. When cellist, cellist uh, Bernard Greenhouse's son-in-law, Nicholas Belanco, uh, wrote to tell us that the third installment of the Greenhouse collection will be ready for pickup at any time, he asked if anyone from the university libraries just happened to be planning a trip to uh, Wellfleet and uh, that's uh, Greenhouse's hometown, which is halfway between the tip and elbow of Cape Cod. So way up there. So one mention of this to Paul and the trip was planned so promptly that, that he, he and Mac arrived on the Cape in time to represent us, the libraries at the memorial service for the great cellist uh, and then loading uh, Paul's van with the remaining contents of his collection, the studio file cabinets, for example, uh, for the trip back to Greensboro. So that's just an example of, of the kind of dedication and hard work that, that Paul has done for all of us. We're very proud of him and uh, really appreciate having this opportunity to honor him for his gift. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I would like now um, to introduce Paul and Janice Hessling by sharing a little bit about them. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Janice Hessling, whose accomplishments are really, frankly, quite amazing. She has served as a pathologist and, the medical, and a medical director for Quest Diagnostics in Greensboro since 2007. After graduating from Notre Dame, she attended um, Duke University Medical School, completing her residency training at the school's medical center, which included spending a fifth year in a surgical pathology fellowship with an emphasis in immunohistochemistry. Dr. Hessling received a PhD at Duke University in microbiology and immunology, spending several years as a postdoctoral fellow in virology, immunology, and cancer research. She is board certified in, a, in anatomic and clinical pathology, in addition to a specialty board certification in cytopathology and extensive experience in neuropathology. We're thrilled to recognize her contribution, as well as that of our esteemed colleague, Paul Hessling. Now, Paul received his MLIS with concentrations in special collections and cataloging from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. 
His first position was as rare book and monographic series cataloger at the Health Science Library at UNC uh, Chapel Hill. He then came to Jackson Library at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro as rare books cataloger and has been happily in that position for over 35 years. Paul also works very closely with SCUA and we are very lucky to have him as a colleague. He has been a book collector for as long as he can remember and enjoys long road trips with his family with frequent visits to bookstores along the way. Now, I did want to let everybody know that earlier today, um, let's see, it was our great honor to present Paul and Janice Hessling with a memorial plaque, which expresses our great appreciation for their continued support and friendship. Their donations, not only to the Home Economic Pamphlet Collection, but to other collections as well, um, are quite amazing and, um, and remarkable and have greatly increased the status of our holdings. Now on to our presentation, which is in the form of a conversation between Paul and our colleague, Carolyn Schenkel, our special collection specialist, and she is indeed very special. I would also like to thank Kelly Coward, who is serving as a technician for Paul, and Patrick Dollar, technician for SCUA. Carolyn, I'll now transition to you. Thank, thank you so much, Kathleen. I really appreciate that. Um, I hope everyone can see Paul and Janice with their plaque. And this was done a little earlier today. And there's a little detail of the plaque. So, while this event is virtual, there's something very important going on inside the library, and that is that we are having an exhibit um, displaying this collection, honoring um, this collection, and we encourage people to come in to see this exhibit, and I'm going to give you a little overview of a tour of it. So this is the Paul and Janice Hessling Home Economics Pamphlet Collection, just a selection of the many pamphlets that we have. Um, it's located in Hodge's Reading Room. We are open from Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. and to 4 p.m. And this exhibit will be up through summer. So here's as you come towards the Hodge's Reading Room. And then we get to see the introductory case. And then please look around the room. There's two vertical cases that have a multitude of fascinating items in here. We have five flat cases filled to the brim with just delicious things for you to look at. So please look through them. And I also want to thank my colleague, Jennifer Brooks. Jennifer was uh, instrumental in helping with this exhibit and this there is an accompanying catalog to go with the exhibit and she just put in a lot of time making this look very um, comprehensive. So, Paul? Yes, I, let me, uh myself and turn on the camera. <laughs> uh, this technology stuff, I don't know. Um, but You're doing I, great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and just, uh, uh, I just want to say thank you folks so much for, for this event and for the very, very kind words. It, um, as it said in the bio, I have happily served as the special collections cataloger for over 35 years and uh, it's it's been a joy okay so are we going to get time to get started carolyn it's time to get started all right okay well i will actually start off with a question for you okay. um I, was, I know some of the folks here are quite familiar with the various collections including home economics pamphlets but some, I don't know about most, but some might <laughs> not be. So I'm hoping you could give a little background on the genesis of the Home Economics Pamphlet Collection. Absolutely. So we've got to cast our minds back like 21 years, 20 to 21 years ago. Um, what was, I had joined the staff in Special Collections and 
I was kind of running into a crisis with one of our collections, the woman's collection. We collect historical cookbooks and it turned out we had a collection of pamphlets that had been interfiled with those books and they were causing, it, that doesn't, that's not a good mix um, <laughs> to have flimsy materials with not so flimsy materials. And we were kind of running into a crisis. So, uh, the special collections librarian at that time, Bill Finley, he and I had several chats about this and came up with the idea that, hey, the easiest solution and perhaps the, the best solution is to create a new collection. Let's call it the Home Economics um, Collection. And that way we could separate it out and they could be put in folders. So this was a fantastic idea. And Paul was part of this because what this meant was, is Paul had to go recatalog everything. <laughs> However, um, we, this was kind of great timing. I'm gonna share a couple of images here and let's see if I can pull this up. Here we go. Get that one. Show y'all a couple of photographs. So what this is, is this is kind of scary. This was when Special Collections and University Archives, we were being renovated. So we're not, we're, we're not new to reno the idea of a renovation. Um, it meant we shut down the com department completely. So while the department was shut down, one of my jobs that I did away from the department was to refolder and literally type all the new labels for the Home Economic Pamphlet Collection. So that's how it kind of got started. Um, and, and those, you know, early pamphlets, they were recipe booklets, they were laundering guides, they included uh, dances and some dancing guides, a little bit of music. I think we've got a guitar um, pamphlet in there. And then later on, government documents were added, both at the state and federal level um, were added to them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so Paul, I got a question for you. What sparked your interest into the home economic pamphlets? Hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, I, stepping back and taking a slightly broader view at first, a lot of collections in our special collection sparked my interest in those subjects. Um, when I worked at the Health Sciences Library, rare books were not a priority. The monographic series were. They had to get out to the doctors fast. So when I came here, I was just dazzled by the wide array of collections. And after settling in and cataloging for a while, um, I was told that there were two collections that had not had any cataloging done. And that was exciting. I mean, there was no template to follow, but it was exciting. And one was the publisher's trade bindings, uh -huh. which for well, a number of years, you know, I, I started picking up and, you know, nice examples and donating them to the library. And the other was, you know, a far cry from that, but equally fascinating was the Lois Linsky Juvenile Collection. Yes. So her collection of mainly 19th century, some earlier mm -hmm. uh, booklets, all housed in a wonderful little, I guess, a, a custom built case for them. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a bigger job than you might think because those were some tiny books. But I also got interested in those. And basically as I became more familiar with uh, the collections here, as part of my rambles to bookstores all over the place. I started picking up things in a number of areas that I thought um, that might be a good fit for special collections. Well, you know, Carolyn has mentioned the beginning of this and, and recataloging, and I'm pretty sure what really caught my interest was a little pamphlet on a patent medicine um, uh, Lydia Pinkham Company, which perhaps some people have heard of. It was one of the most famous ones out there. And well, not she, she died before a lot of this happened, but um, they were relentless advertisers. Mm -hmm. And um, that got me 
checking online to see if I could find any of these things, and particularly Olivia Pinkham. And while I was doing that, I was encountering other stuff um, that I was not particular familiar, particularly familiar with, but you know, all under the kind of home economics pamphlets umbrella. And I thought, well, you know, most of our collections or many of them are, you know, complete or nearly complete. I said, well, this would be a wonderful opportunity to, for want of a better term, make a difference. And it would be a collection that, you know, it, it was small at the time, but really had potential to grow and I thought become a great research collection in, in a number of different areas, everything from women's studies to art to, you know, all the home economics related topics. So that was kind of how I got into it. And kind of to that end, um, you know, there were some decisions to be made about maybe what to exclude, but I, uh, I don't know. I guess I've always been a believer too that as, um, you know, a collection matures, um, time passes and, what still doesn't seem that terribly long ago to me, which is like around 1960, <laughs> um, that's actually 60 years old. And so these these pamphlets, you know, <laughs> I, I, so I didn't want to actually try and limit myself to just a certain decade or anything like that. It's the goal is to be comprehensive, and and also I I didn't I wasn't nearly as familiar with this. Uh, genre as I am now, and I didn't really know what was available out there. So it seemed to me that the best way to do this would be to um, uh, go for broke. Um, <laughs> not literally. I mean, that's <laughs> Jan, Jan, Jan put the brakes on that sort of thing. But, but and, and I soon found that searching and trying to buy individual items was really not the way to get a collection going. I mean, you could you could get some fine pieces, but it would be very limited, and it would take more than more than one lifetime <laughs> to <laughs> acquire things that way. So that was basically when I started, and it was kind of a a golden days for uh, buying in bulk. So I was able to get that. that some actually what turns out to be fairly common stuff, but you can tell by the pictures and you get pretty quickly, you can get so you go, oh, okay, that's probably from the 20s or the 30s or even before, you know, 1900. There's a lot of those in there too. And, uh, and actually I should say 20s and 30s are probably my favorite decades for these. I just love the Art Deco. I love the, I just love the pamphlets from them. So, um, yeah, I, I pretty much made our living room disappear with boxes of these things. And, you know, Beth and I regularly go on, well, I, I kind of call them book vacations. Beth says, you know, vacations with, unfortunately, some books. Um, oh, no, no, she comes, she comes with me, too. So between, um, you know, plumbing the collections of book dealers and and doing online, it, it, it certainly did grow quickly. So, um, and uh, the, the, the great thing was, I, I should just say that I, I am not personally a collector of these materials. I mean, I really enjoy them. I love working with them, but they don't form part of my kind of personal collecting interest. So really you know, finding them, getting them at least in the beginning making lists of them i had to abandon that <laughs> after a while the list just got too long or a part b or c um but then i got the added delight when they circled back around from skua to us for cataloging and you know i you know i love doing cataloging i love working with these they uh, they don't 
pose particularly unique problems, but they they, they have their quirks. And uh, so they're great fun to do that too. With. So, uh, you know, I kind of got doubly rewarded. So, and plus the library got some pamphlets, so. Yes, we did. Yeah. Yes, we did. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And here's something. Um, of course, what makes something valuable is when it can be used and when it needs mm -hmm. used. And for several years, we had, and a lot of people here attended them and remember them, a wonderful annual event called Vintage Beyonds. And uh, so I was wondering if you could, you know, as, as a great outreach project, could you talk about this and the role of HE PAMs in the event? Absolutely. So for our viewers who are looking at Paul, he's got some posters behind him from the event. Yeah, there he goes. <laughs> but let me start sharing a screen. Let me let me get this to come up. Hang on. Thank you for being patient with me. All right, so let's talk about vintage Vions. I can't talk about vintage Vions without mentioning two of my colleagues, um, Erica Rao and Callie Coward. They're, if you are looking at my screen, they are um, the, I'm the one in glasses. So <laughs> they are to, to the side of me. And this is from one of our very early vintage Vions. I think this is from the one that we did in 2015. And what, um, was the impetus for this is that we were able to start digitizing some of our pamphlets and they um, sparked an idea of how to use these in the library. Now this was, as you can tell, this is pre-pandemic, so which was a different time. <laughs> um, but we would invite large, you know, we would invite the public, we invite the campus community to come in and sample these recipes. We couldn't do this without all the help of the UNCG library staff uh, due to some constraints. It had to be, all the dishes had to be prepared by library staff members. So here you see us, and then here you see an example of one of the dishes. Paul, I think this one was yours. Um, yes, yeah, that looks familiar. <laughs> I thought, it, yeah, I, I kind of put that one out of my mind, but um. yeah, um, I actually remember tasting that one. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, was, it was pretty good. So here we go. Here's some of the posters that that were from the different events. Um, this is the one from 2015 and 2016. So again, this ran for about three years. Um, we did a different theme each of those years. In 2016, we were very lucky. We were the recipients of the university's library's innovation grant. Um, this let us do even more outreach. Because of the vintage Vions, we were able to reach out to um, some of the classes. We actually had one of the residential colleges base some of their coursework around some of the recipes um, in our collections. We've had um, a newspaper article come out of this, a local one we've had in our state. There's been articles in our state about it. Um, it's been on social media. It was a great way to reach out to the students who kind of got to discover this hidden collection. Um, professors heard about it over in the nutrition program, over in marketing. We've actually used a lot of these materials for some of the marketing classes. Great. And then this is just a little smorgasbord of some of the things that went on during um, Vintage Fiance. And there we are for the 1920s, all dressed up, dressed up in our flapper gear. And then just got little snapshots of some of the food being prepared. Some of us would take pictures while we were making things and post it to social media, just really getting people involved. Um, we, had a, we get a lot of research requests from all over. Recently, we had someone requesting a pamphlet that was from Weight Watchers. She wanted to 
wanted to revisit her Weight Watchers diet that she had used in the 1970s. And anybody who uses Weight Watchers, it's very different now. So she actually found the pamphlet in our collection. Um, we've talked about Erica and Kelly and I, we, we went to the North Carolina um, NCLA and talked about our pamphlet collection and the outreach that we were able to do because we earned the innovation grant. And then our last one that we did, it was focused on North Carolina and North Carolina cookbooks. So this was like a fantastic poster that went with it. We do have our, some of our materials can be digitized. Of course, we got to be mindful of copyright, but there's two aspects of the collection that are online. We've got the home economic pamphlet collection um, and the North Carolina cookbooks collection. Those are both online and available through our online platform gateway. And Paul, I had to end with a picture of you. <laughs> this again is from, from our first event. Um, I think you were the recipient of the, I've forgotten quite the correct title for this, but. Was it the most interesting or? It, it might have been. It might have been the most interesting recipe, but I think this was your winning entry. And here Callie is presenting you with your award. <laughs> <laughs> At least it was a step up for from uh, several times winning the worst recipe, but uh, th that was intentional. <laughs> So oh, just, just to remind our viewers that the exhibit is located in the Hodges Reading Room, which is open from 9 to 4, Monday through Friday. And, and Paul, just for our viewers, for, just to help prep them for when they come to view the exhibit, is, are there some facets of the exhibit that you want them to experience, pay special attention to? Well, um, I guess I... Uh... What I could say first about the exhibit is um, it's, it, you know, with, with uh, between up to now, not as yet, I should say, uncatalogued pamphlets, and which I had on hand and could browse through, and all of the pamphlets that we've had cataloged, it was a daunting endeavor to do that. Um, there was just so much. And um, so what I wanted to do, I think pretty quickly, I, of course, did it did overkill and uh, just jotted down something like 35 possible themes that <laughs> cover in this. And you know, there was a there was a question of, do, do I want to go broad? Or do I want to go deep in this? Going deep would mean a lot less different themes that could be shown. I mean, you know, of course, you could show one thing in some depth, but I was, I've always been kind of fascinated by, well, even as a cataloger, just how do you approach an individual pamphlet? Is it a, about a washing machine or is it a cooking book or just what are they? So, what I thought I would do is basically do about as many themes as I could to kind of show some different aspects of it. And, uh, you know, of course, to do that, I had to jettison over half of the possibilities. Um, but I, I also wanted to maybe focus on some things that people might not think about right away. Um, so for instance, you know, one of my possible topics was baking. Well, that's a huge subject, and we've got a huge <laughs> number of pamphlets on that. And it's baking and all, not just general baking, but well, you've got everything from, um, you know, uh, the ingredients you use, such as you know, baking powder, baking soda, um, flour, um, to such things as like the Pillsbury Bake Off, that we've got a long run of those. We don't have all of them yet, but we've got a long run of them. So, you know, it was to, okay, well, let's let's not go that way, but let's, so in this case, I went with baking powder, which actually turned out to be, you know, this is not technically part of my job to <laughs> go digging into the history of baking powder, but it was just fascinating. 
and some other things that people might not think about so much. I, in all, there's like 17 themes there. And, you know, patent medicines, I figured that was perfect because I'm fascinated by them. I'm fascinated by how lethal they could be. Um, mm -hmm. The number of things they could cure, supposedly. Um, you know, uh, another one would be mascots, you know, corporate, corporate, you know, trademarks and mascots. And I wanted to kind of avoid some of the, the, the ones that everybody knew, the Pillsbury Doughboy or Mr. Peanut. So, um, but I was finding that uh, even companies you would not imagine had a mascot had one. <laughs> um, the, the one that kind of keeps coming up to me is um, there was a company called Robert Shaw who made the controllers for electric appliances, you know, so that would be the thing that you plugged into your electric skillet and then plugged in the wall. Um, they had a, a mascot with a little dial for a face and he was named Mr. Controls. And he appears on some of their publications. So I was like, okay, this Mr. Controls must be in this exhibit. But it's, it's hopefully it's something that everybody can find something that interests them. I mean, it's everything from our own, well, Greensboro's own um, Pokery Press, which is nice. something that I got fascinated with um, through such, you know, something like shaped books where, um, you know, the, the publisher actually thought it was a good idea. And I agree with them that, you know, if they were going to advertise a box of Quaker Oats, by God, they were going to cut it into the shape <laughs> of a box of Quaker Oats. And I've been told by uh, uh, Jennifer Brooks, I think I, I saw you on here, Jennifer, that the most popular object or you know, pamphlet in that collection is a, a pamphlet advertising Ready Whip that is cut into the shape of a can of Ready Whip. So um, hopefully, you know, there's something for people who are interested in children's books and books about children. Um, there's my, I'm, I gave myself a case for like curator's choice. And basically, um, one of the things that really I like about these pamphlets is and am impressed by the skill of advertising agencies is how a cover can just grab you and not let you go. I mean, one of, I think both of my favorite pamphlets in the collection are based on their covers or like in the illustration on the inside. So again, I wanted to kind of, okay, here's the scope. Here's a lot of pamphlets for people to look at. But if you want to focus in on some, you can enjoy. Well, speaking of that, um, and also for the fact that you've you've been cataloging these, what are the, some of the interesting aspects that you've encountered with them as a publication? Oh, oh. <laughs> memories. Um, you know, as cataloging real cataloging challenges they're not up at the top level of difficulty by any means but there's there's certain things about them that are just so frustratingly repeated and one of them is the seeming desire of any number of companies to never put a date on anything wow. and it's come on um and Actually, we'll have some slides and hopefully we can get to this. There's some little tricks that we picked up over, over the time. Um, there's, you know, memories of, um, oh, again, it's all things that have kind of caught my eye. There's a wonderful series by, uh, well, okay, wonderful series of uh, booklets from Pet Milk mm -hmm. that are by uh, fictitious, but actually very a uh, very real person who had an incredible career in advertising for pet mill uh, called Mary Lee Taylor. And they put out a whole series of books over the course of over 20 years. And I have no idea how many they are, but basically I think of them as the four two or four or six series because it's they're you know, tempting dishes for two or four or six. 
um, you know, festive meals for two or four or six. And I can't say the recipe. Well, the recipes are doable, which is great. Whether you want to do them, considering that every one of them uses pep evaporated milk, I, I don't know. Um, the dish that you showed from Vintage Beyonds was, came from one of those pamphlets. And, you know, they also, I've, I've gotten a fa fascination with just really kind of grotesque recipes. And there actually is a, something in the, there's a, a theme for what vile vittles, I think I called it. And please take a look at some of those recipes in the pictures. Um, but that's, you know, that's another thing that has kind of fascinated me and uh, led me down the dark path of, you know, seeking to win worst recipes <laughs> awards from, um, but yeah, and actually it, it might be a good time because um, <clears throat> I actually, I think that's our last question um i do have some slides and, oh yes yeah and i'd like to show you and, and all of them are ones that caught my attention for one reason or another i'm probably considering gonna have to skip because as always i way over prepared and there's like 50 some slides but we'll see some of them and maybe whisk through some quickly but fantastic okay so all right. should, should we go to that yes okay now here we go i'm testing Kelly's tutelage for this. Um, da, 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 da. Which one do I want? Okay. Here we go. Okay. Actually, we can go back. All right. And okay. Oh, let me shrink down this thing too. Okay. Um, one of the things you find out pretty quickly is that you really never know where one of these will take you. Um, what appears to be a, a pretty, not, not the greatest looking, I don't know if it had a nice cover or not, but this one certainly doesn't. But it does have the interesting title of health via the carrot and other vegetables. Uh, it seems innocent enough. I was trying to date it and it's not, it's not uncommon. I found no date. But, and here's one of the things, little tips we picked up. Um, it does have a two digit postal code. So this is very useful in finding an approximate date. Um, it was implemented for large cities in 1943, which Cleveland certainly is one. And non-mandatory five digit zip codes were introduced nationwide in 1963. So for cataloging purposes, we can almost certainly say that this was issued between 1943 and 1963, which is a lot better than just saying 20th century sometime. <laughs> um, just as a publication with a five digit zip code was probably issued in 1963 or later. And I was also wondering who W.G. Bernard, oops, I'm pointing at the wrong screen, W.G. Bernard is, and what is the Natural Foods Institute? which led me down an entertaining and surprising rabbit hole. <clears throat> Bernard turns out to be William Grover Bernard, who lived from 1887 to 1964, and started a company in 1921 to sell modern kitchen products through demonstrations, live demonstrations. Long story short, the Bernard family became vegetarians and promoters of healthy eating and established a mail-ordered health food and vitamin business under the new company name, the Natural Food Institute in Cleveland. Bernard then opened a storefront in 1939 in Cleveland to sell whole foods and vitamins and to demonstrate and sell a, sell a blender named the Vitamix. Yes, that one. Which is that still, one. Still going strong today under fourth generation leadership. The blender had been introduced to W.G. Bernard in 1937, the same year he wrote a book on natural foods, which is presumably the first edition of this pamphlet or the pamphlet I showed, which is actually a sixth edition. 
In addition to being an early promoter of juicing as a tool for good health, Bernard was a pioneer in another field. In 1949, Bernard's son convinced his at first reluctant father to make and air a 30 minute commercial on WEWS television in Cleveland, early days of TV. Okay, they needed, they found they needed to sell 18 Vitamixes in order to break even on the cost of this commercial. They ended up selling over 400. Mm -hmm. So a uh, rousing success. This was broadcast in 1950, that late night TV staple, the infomercial in 1950 at that time was born. Yes, this was the very first infomercial. Oh my word. Yeah. Okay. I have, okay. A little, uh, just a little clip from the 30 minute, the original 30 minute thing is on the Vitamin, Vitamix website, but here's a little bit of it. So you can see Bernard in action. Ladies and gentlemen, in presenting Oh, Mary Post for 1950. I'm going to give you a demonstration of one of the most wonderful machines that was ever invented, the Vitamix machine. And I'm going to talk to you on the most vital subject that concerns you and your family, and that is health. With health, we have wealth. We're the richest person on earth. Without health, you're a miserable failure. You'll lose your wealth, you'll lose your job, you'll lose your income, and you'll lose your life. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know the first thing that you're going to say is, what is doing that wonderful work? What is performing that correct? I'm going to call your attention to the machine here, the mechanical part of it, the Vitamix. Remember the name, Vitamix. We have a motor that travels at the rate of 8,000 revolutions a minute on low, 14,000 revolutions a minute on high. You get a one year guarantee on this motor. If anything goes wrong with it, in one whole year, the company will repair or replace it free of charge. I'm going to call your attention to the business end of the machine. And that. Okay. <laughs> That, oh, we're getting we're getting a lot of comments about this one, Paul. This is Papa Bernard. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I could continue a little bit. I, well, but let, that, let, I, I would just say go to the Vitamix website and watch this. And when you get to around minute thirteen, his rant, for lack of a better term, is hilarious. Um, his rant on applesauce. <laughs> and what what mama does to, to make applesauce as opposed to the Vitamix. So do try and watch that. Oh, we've got a right. great comment that this ranks up right up there with the Lucille Ball Vegemin bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Bernard is, he's a caution. So let me get back to sharing the screen. Okay, uh, this is just one of those eye-catching covers that I was talking about from Carnation, came out in 1966. The cover to me is spectacularly and comprehensively orange. And <laughs> several of the interior illustrations are similarly saturated in color. And here's a couple of them. And I became interested in corporate pseudonyms while cataloging these pamphlets, and this is an interesting one. Uh, the book implies that it is written by a certain Mary Blake. Okay, I found it interesting. There's no title page, just a message from Mary Blake. And I have found that when you see an illustration rather than a photograph, it's a pretty good indication that you're looking at a pseudonym or a corporate identity. Uh, for example, Betty Crocker is a good one, but this isn't definitive by any means. And there's also the question of whether there's a real person behind the pseudonym. And if so, is it used for one or many individuals? Um, this Mary Blake has been identified with someone named Virginia M. Piper, who did write for Carnation, but I'm not convinced that she wrote all of these Mary Blake books. 
We have another pamphlet from 1965, a year before the Orange Book, Cooking with a Velvet Touch, again with a portrait and letter by Mary Blake on the first page. When we put them together, either Mary Blake found the fountain of youth or we <laughs> had hit on a corporate identity makeover in 1965-1966. And to add a little bit more chronological heft to this, this is a picture of Mary Blake from 1932. This nice kind of matronly woman grows younger into this very competent looking person and then she drops about 10 or 15 years. Anyway, I, consistency was not one of their main. We've got a great comment that somebody says that she's Benjamin Buttoning it. <laughs> yes, yes, she is. <laughs> okay. Oh, actually, we, we were running kind of short. Um, I will just kind of quickly show some of these and stop on some others. This is just another one that I found very attractive and with another corporate pseudonym for Carol French. Um, I, th I think it was Wikipedia that said this might have been the, this booklet might have been the oldest use of uh, the fictitious Carol French. We don't know if it was based on anybody else though. And here's a couple of, well, to some people very attractive illustrations of some of the things you can make with French's products. And I, look, I've got to say, how could I avoid a picture of pot roast with pancakes? <laughs> oh, um, well, this is a really nice leaflet advertising a waterless miracle cleanser. Um, it turns out to have a fascinating history involving coal furnaces, wallpaper, Macy's, and Captain Kangaroo. Oh. Um, it started out uh, in 1912 as a manufacturer of soap and cleaners in Cincinnati, foundered. Then they, uh, uh, one of their managers, Noah McVicker, developed a flour-based putty for cleaning wallpaper, which was necessary because of all the soot from coal. Um, they got a contract with Kroger, their fortunes turned around. But after World War II, there was again a crisis as oil and gas furnaces replaced coal furnaces and vinyl wallpaper was introduced. So you didn't need one of these wallpaper specialist wallpaper cleaners. So Joe McVicker, Noah's nephew, joined Cuddle to the Cut Hall to save the company from bankruptcy. And Joe's sister-in-law, Kay Zuffall, who's a nursery school teacher, saw a magazine about making article about making Christmas ornaments using wallpaper cleaner. And she suggested repurposing the product, come on product, as a children's toy and suggested the name Play-Doh. A significant improvement over Noah and Joe's rainbow modeling contest. <laughs> Noah removed detergents from Cuddle and added color and an almond scent and Play-Doh was born. Um, and I'll bet very few people ever suspected they were playing with some wallpaper cleaner. <laughs> um, it did well, but then Joe pers persuaded Bob Keeshan, who you might know, to feature the product on his Captain Kangaroo show as a toy for children. And it soon appeared on other shows aimed at children. It worked. Sales <laughs> went from $100,000 in 1954 to nearly $3 million in 1958. Um, okay, I'm yeah, running a little short. Okay, I'll just point out that this was just something I randomly found in a box and just was stunned by the condition and the fact that it was apparently published in 1902 by a company that there is very little information about there, but they made some baking products like uh, cornstarch and uh, baking powder and baking soda. So this was for a prize contest that they ran. Um, okay, Better Babies is actually in the children's section of the exhibit. But what I'd like to show you, and this is pet milk, and they keep talking about the fact that it is irradiated. 
And I know they say it's irradiated using ultraviolet light to add, add vitamin D, but it just doesn't sound right in this context. So I went in the search to see if I could find any of these weaning cups that you could just pour your irradiated milk straight into when your baby outgrew the bottle. Um, I did find some that had this, although this trademark text wasn't on there, and they had the two soldiers and pet milk on the opposite side. What they left off was use irradiated. Since I, I could not find any with use irradiated on the other side, otherwise I would own one now. <laughs> Cooking for a man from A1. And again, I'm just gonna kind of flip through these real quickly, just so you can see some of the things that have caught my eye and piqued to my interest while cataloging. Here's some nice recipes from there, depending on your taste. But this is the cool part. There's a uh, letter asking if you would like to send for another Hugelin product aside, of, aside from A1, Torex Concentrated Beef. Although GF Hugelin and brothers may no longer be with us, I'm sure the memory and taste of Torex lingers on. Remember, and this is a quotation from them, Torex will give a meaty lift to your favorite recipes. Okay, this, this is a long story, so I won't get into it, but it was just a weird thing. This is during the pandemic. Callie was cataloging, as it turns out, I was cataloging this little leaflet from Custo well, it's almost the same time within about a week from a different box of pamphlets. The coincidence is eerie. A uh, booklet for Costo. The packaging is exactly the same. This is, a, you know, includes a little more in there. But basically, I couldn't find out much of anything about either of these. And uh, one of our questions was, well, what, what came first, Custo or Costo? Mm -hmm. I think Custo, but that's just my opinion. Uh, this was just interesting. Remember the dating problem. This, of course, has no dates, no postal codes to help us. But it do, does have a subscription offer, send for this, for Time and Life magazines. And by looking on the internet and finding they have archives of these covers, I was able to determine that these both came from 1961. And so probably that's when the pamphlet was issued. Oh, this is, this is also in the exhibit. These are wonderful pamphlets and they promote their, their two big medicines are Fedford's Black Draft and McElroy's Wine of Cardumi, Nature's Remedy for Female Diseases. But this is what I found fascinating is there's in addition to lots of pencil notations throughout this uh, booklet, someone had filled out this examination blank. I'll just give you a couple of things. So they're asking all your statistics, age 107, weight 1,000 pounds, gaining, I guess gaining how much weight you're gaining, 75, married 10 times, employment, nothing. Do you smoke, chew tobacco, use snuff or drink whiskey? All of them. Anyway, it goes on and on. And you know, we finally find out that this was filled out apparently by someone named Simon Belzebub, who lived in, or his post office was Rip Van, Van Winkle in the county of Watkins. Just I, who did this and when was where my question. Oh, so, um, and again, I'm just going to flip through some of these. This was, we have a blank copy of Mickey Mouse recipe scrapbook. And this was one of those great, buy a loaf of bread, you get a free picture in there. And this is oh, wow. one of the pages with a picture in there. And this is the full set. You know, both are available for auction at disnified prices. So this is just so odd, I had to put it in. Um, this, <laughs> I don't know if children find this as unsettling as most adults seem to be, but anthropomorphic oats, um, going through the process to puny or poor oats not allowed here. 
um, going through the process, taking off their little jackets of becoming to, through a roller, <laughs> a three minute oat flake. I like to think that this might be one of the three oats on the cover, but I don't know. And that this is interesting, <laughs> and all jumping happily in the can with a happy ending. Yum, it's good. Uh, this one is just, it, it's a lot of interesting things about it. It's got a very famous illustrator. This is one that I didn't expect to see what I saw. And this will probably have to be about the last. Um, when you open it up, what it has is some line drawings and some color illustrations with directions for directions for coloring. And here's the story of Sarasota, who is actually the mascot of this milling company. There's another illustration. Lots of general direct instructions for artists, very useful. And then we have what turns out to be the opposite of one of the happy books. This is Mrs. Winslow's domestic receipt book for 1875. One reason I include it is I think it might be the oldest pamphlet in the collection, maybe. Um, it was actually copyrighted in 1874, I guess published in 1875. All right, uh, just quickly. It's a book of recipes and household hymns. It promotes patent medicines from Curtis and Brown, including various things, including uh, Mrs. Winslow's uh, soothing syrup. Soothing syrup was originally compounded by, sh compounded by Charlotte Winslow, a pediatric nurse, to treat crying or teething fussy babies, and also for babies with dysentery. It was extremely popular. And Jeremiah Curtis reported selling over a million and a half bottles in 1868. So it was everywhere. Tragically, despite their disclaimers, the syrup contained large amounts of alcohol and morphine, which proved fatal to many babies due to overdose, addiction, or withdrawal, and earned it the nickname, the baby killer. It, came, it contained the equivalent of 20 drops of laudanum when the uh, recommended amount for six-month-old babies was no more than two to three drops. Despite denunciations by medical, the American Medical Association, the company was forced to remove morphine, but continued to sell this potion until the 1930s. Okay, so I think that's about it. Um, I just let everybody revel in Lucy. This pamphlet seems to catch everybody's eye. And you will notice that there's a whole lot of smoking going on in this one. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are selected pages. They're not smoking on every page. I had to do this fish dish. I just had to. And we finally get to, uh, uh, here we go at the end. Uh, Philip Morris, Morris was the original sponsor of the I Love Lucy show. And just kind of fun little fact, in their very earliest commercials uh, for their earliest shows, they had little, some people might even remember this, seeing this, little animated stick figures of Lucy and Ricky repelling down a pack of Philip Morris. Okay, we ran, okay, Chiquita Banana. It's also interesting. Oh, here's some of those for two or four. Oh, this one's just two or four or six. And as I said, I've gotten, gotten some viral recipes out of these. <laughs> but here's the actual person, here's actual uh, Mary Lee Taylor. It was a real, real person. And her real name was Irma Pretz, Pretz, P-R-O-E-T-Z. I don't have time, but look her up sometime because she is just fascinating. Multi-award winning advertising executive who transformed the pet milk company. Okay, the final one is, these are two of the ballots from the 2017 Vintage Beyonds. And these were for my recipes. <laughs> uh, the common here is, the uh, asparagus pie is frightening. And this one describes, uh, votes for it as most interesting recipe, a congealed asparagus vomit style dish. <laughs> and that is all. 
Thank you, Paul. There's been a lot of a lot of enthusiasm um, shown in the comments, and your scholarship has been recognized. Just how much oh, oh how much effort you you've done just to really not only discover more about these items, but the back history. But yeah, and the problem with that is, you know, considering, you know, my job really with these is just to catalog them. There's, and I can't go down these rabbit holes as often as I'd like to, because there's really <laughs> not much of a place for, you know, that kind of information on, on a catalog record. You know, if we were doing an archival record or something, maybe yes, but so I love I love sharing this sort of, sort of thing with people. So, well, thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any. I see a lot of appreciation. I don't see any questions in here, um, and we have run into our time for our event. But this this has just been eye opening for me, and it's also made me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. well, thank everybody for, for coming to this. I really appreciate it. It's been wonderful. Oh, we want a part two. Oh, <laughs> I, think, I love it. I think I've got enough slides you know, for another one sometimes. So. Well, if you're up for it. Uh, we, we shall see. First okay. Time, First, I got to get everything done that I didn't get done while I was getting ready for this exhibit. So, but then. Yeah, okay. Yeah, All right. Small break, perhaps. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. It's great to have you.